thank you for joining us today and for all the future sessions you'll be joining us for. I'll remind you that NSBA is nonpartisan, member driven, and with 65,000 members across every state and industry, we're a pretty powerful voice for small business advocacy. Today, we are asking you to submit all questions through the Q&A panel, not the chat feature. We're leaving the chat open, but please be mindful, just as with any meeting, sidebar conversations can be quite distracting, so please chat expeditiously. I will also remind you that today is not about business development or networking with each other for business development. I don't know if any of you small business owners are on the, on the line, take a, a, a breath of relief with that like I do. It's, you know, you're always thinking about business development and you're always thinking about sales. And today we get to do something really interesting and that is coming together to collaborate on ideas in order to inform legislators and policymakers on the realities of the small business experience. Today we need to articulate what is useful and what is not in describing that experience and the legislative impacts. That is the only thing we are coming together to discuss today. Treasure this time as I do. Value it as a collaborative discussion in order to bring a true small business voice forward. It is and has been my honor to serve NSBA this way, and it has been a treat to work with the board and the leadership council. I'm really happy to share this time with you and my cohorts in kicking off this session. Todd McCracken, the NSBA president and CEO, and Tamika Montgomery, a board trustee here at NSBA, are gonna help me welcome you into today's event. So about today's event, the Small Business Congress, it happens every two years, and it's how NSBA decides our priority issues for the coming two years. It's typically in person, which as an extrovert, I miss in ways that I don't have words for, but nonetheless, we will do this digitally. Um, this year, in fact, we're able to do this over seven webinars, over three weeks. And these priorities that we developed today are really a guiding star. They're not written in stone. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that if we haven't articulated or looked into the crystal ball about what's going to happen that we won't develop a position on it, but it's being purposeful, proactive, and, and bringing our voices together in a way that says with what we know and what's, it, what's in front of us, here's how we're gonna advocate and help edu educate our legislators and policymakers. So the goal today is to hear from some experts on the issues. A treat, again, one something I thoroughly enjoy that, that Todd and the, the staff at NSB pulled together such great speakers for us. I'm gonna ask questions. Uh, we, we're able to ask questions about the policies and really understand what we're talking about. And then we're gonna to work to get a read on how, how all of us on this session are feeling through some informal polls that Molly's gonna run for us. And then finally, we're gonna vote on priorities. Issue committees play an important role in helping develop and fine tune these issues. If you wanna be involved in these, please email Meryl. You know, around the Leadership Council, I remember the discussions we had when we started it up. We created it in order to proactively and constructively bring into the board a wider and more diverse reach from across the country. It's been an overwhelmingly positive experience. I'm so pleased to have all of you Leadership Council members on this call with us today. I thought it might be interesting also to hear from one of our new board members, Tamika Montgomery, about her experience engaging first with the Leadership Council and now her path to a board seat. So, Tamika. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining the board. Tamika runs Core Strategy Partners in Maryland, an economic development insights and strategy consulting firm. Sort of an interesting path for Tamika with NSBA. She was first on the NSBA board as part of an affiliate, Denver Metro Cham Chamber of Commerce. And then she was a presidential appointee at the SBA, leading the Office of Entrepreneurial Development. And then she came back to NSBA on the Leadership Council, and finally she's with us here on the board. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Tamika. I'm very interested to, to hear from you. Great, thank you, ML. I appreciate the opportunity to share and the opportunity to serve. Um, something that you said really resonate in terms of what NSBA um, gives us as business owners the opportunity, and that is to advocate and to educate. And um, serving on the Leadership Council is a great entree into kind of um, kind of uh, testing out our chops, right, uh, in, in that whole advocacy and engaging with our legislators. You know, as you mentioned, I um, come to this in a very kind of in a different path um, when I was serving in the Obama administration you know I in terms of advocating on behalf of small businesses I was more so um, kind of being responsible for key policies that were being implemented to impact small business owners 
And so now to be able to serve on the board of trustees to give voice and lend my voice um, on behalf of more small of small businesses to really continue to drive policies on behalf of small businesses. So I really encourage um, business owners and leadership council members to take advantage of this opportunity. I know um, as business owners, we're so head down in our small businesses that it can be challenging to, to look up and to have those conversations, but there, there's impact. I can speak to something very specific here in our area. Um, I'm in Montgomery County, Maryland, and I was speaking with a local legislator about um, recommendations that would be helpful for business owners during this COVID period of COVID in terms of being able to stay in their office spaces um, and offered some recommendations um, that he's considering to put forth on how the, the local government can provide support to existing business owners to help them stay in the office spaces that they're, that they're in. So, um, you know, it's very important. And I think, like I said, the, the leadership council is that pathway to gain deeper um, involvement within an SBA. And so I'm excited to be a part of the board and um, the board of trustees and continue the good work that we all are doing. Thank you for, for working with us. I appreciate your insight and I am smiling remembering the, um, the experience of being mentored by other NSBA members about how to advocate and how to have the conversations you just described and, and truly the treat of taking a moment from our, oh, what's the next sale, what's the next sale, you know, got to make the donuts kind of focus into how do we collaborate and really do something meaningful together. So thank you. I appreciate your comments very much. I'm very glad you're on the board. Thank you. With that, I'd like to introduce you all to Gary Kushner. Gary Kushner is gonna drive our conversation today around all of the many complex and interesting topics we have moving forward. Uh, Gary was the chair of the Michigan delegation at the White House Conference on Small Business. He's a past winner of NSBA's Lou Shattuck Adv Advocate of the Year Award. It's a fascinating thing, this heritage of NSBA teaching knowing how and teaching those that come along how to how to advocate. Lou Shattuck, um, Larry Nannis talks about how Lou Shattuck really taught him how to do this. Larry Nannis taught myself and many of others how to do this. You know, past year, Gary, I watch how you stand and how you talk to people and how informed and clear you are in it. And I, I really think there's something very important about this collaboration and heritage of the organization. So, Gary, I want to make sure everybody knows some of your other um, really important characteristics that you are the advocate of the year, you're a past chair of NSBA, you're also, I believe, a past chair of the Small Business Association of Michigan as well. Um, one of the things that intrigues me about NSBA is when I look around board meetings and I see so many past chairs still attending year after year, contributing to that longevity and making sure that we're passing how to advocate and experience. So one of the things, Gary, that I've always appreciated about your voice on the board is the steady and consistent counsel and advocacy discussions. You bring a current and informed perspective on the issues. You have this expertise that you bring of today, but you also bring a wealth of experience in terms of previous similar discussions. You know, what's old is new again, and, and issues sometimes resurface. So having the texture of, you know, we've worked some of these things out before, this is why they came about, and some of the best practices also in terms of how to most effectively advocate. Tamika, you talked a bit about how you were able to go in and talk to your local legislator. There's different approaches that you take at different times to, to make the most impact depending on where we are in the process, depending who's in position. But, but one of the things that I think I have appreciated, Gary, from you is, is that perspective of how and when to do what kind of thing. So anyways, with, with all that in mind, oh, more than welcome. And with all that in mind, I would very much like to turn it over to you so that, oh, I'm just gonna turn it back to Todd, who's gonna to outline our roundtable goals and introduce our speakers. But Gary, I'm looking forward to your leadership in, in our conversation today. So Todd, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mel. Actually, I think I'll let, I'll, I will let Gary sort of do his uh, uh, policy uh, uh, overview first, and then I'll, I'll get, to our, get to our speakers in our roundtable discussion that Gary and I will manage together. 
Sounds great. Thank you for that great introduction, uh, ML. I'm going to have to take you on the road with me when I, when I do talks. Uh, that was amazing. And by the way, Lou Shattuck is the one who mentored me back in the uh, early to mid-1980s on advocating on a, on a national scale. Um, very briefly, because I'm very much looking forward to the uh, roundtable discussion, I want to talk a little bit about uh, not just how we got to where we are, but uh, 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 two or three of our um, policy positions on healthcare. One of the first uh, and certainly most impactful to small business is the rising costs of healthcare. Um, I get a kick out of this because I remember back in the late 1970s and early 1980s, um, I was working with the CEO of a very uh, uh, mid-sized uh, firm um, and he was complaining horribly because the cost of family coverage uh, at that time for his firm was coming close to $3,000 a year. And he was concerned about, you know, these costs are just getting way out of control. Um, today, uh, all of us would accept a $3,000 a year cost uh, for our, our employees' health care for their families. In fact, we're now over $20,000 a year, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, in health care costs. Um, the ACA, which Interestingly, just to give you a historical perspective, uh, there were many parts of the ACA which NSBA supported, the whole idea of personal responsibility, uh, in large part that came out of the Heritage Foundation back in the uh, early 2000s, uh, we supported and that manifested itself in the individual mandate, which today still technically exists in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in law, but has a zero penalty. Uh, and we're waiting on the Supreme Court to decide if the having a zero penalty not only removes the individual mandate out of the ACA, but whether or not it invalidates the entire ACA. So do we go back to a pre-2010 world of um, how we deliver healthcare in a, in a group environment to our employees? And how do all citizens in the US access healthcare? Um, parts of the ACA, we, we may have agreed with the concept um, at the time, but now recognize that it's not working and there needs to be fixes. So for example, we've taken the position that the current maximum cost uh, in a small group plan cannot exceed three times the cost for, for an older employee, cannot exceed three times the cost of a 21-year-old employee. And that has caused, rather than lowering the costs for older employees, it's raised the costs on younger employees in order to fall within the three-to-one ratio. Uh, we're now advocating for a five-to-one ratio with some provisions to keep the costs for younger employees who very often take the position I don't need health insurance, I'm, I'm 22, I'm Superman or Superwoman, and don't uh, want to elect a high cost plan. There are other provisions as well uh, that we, we have supported and actually gotten into law. So for example, the creation of the, uh, the ICHRA, the Individual Coverage HRA, was something that we uh, advanced and supported. Um, as, uh, as it came about just a few years ago, so that small employers who felt they could not afford necessarily group health coverage for their employees could instead provide a tax-free benefit for the employee to go to the exchange or the marketplace and purchase coverage and then get reimbursed under an employer plan. That was prohibited um, out of the IRS's interpretation of the ACA back in 2013. Uh, we were successful in getting that uh, uh, allowed and put, and put back into law. Um, healthcare cost is a big issue for uh, small employers. Uh, we know that large employers have the ability to offer a healthcare uh, much more favorably. And so we wanna make sure small employers have that opportunity as well. Related to that um, 
is a, uh, a tax parity issue uh, on, on healthcare and the different benefit plans. If I'm a small C Corp, I can participate as an owner of that C Corp in my own employees, uh, my own group health plan that I offer to all my employees. If I'm a sole proprietor, a partner in a partnership, a sub S Corp where I own 2% or more, I am prohibited, I'm not considered an employee and can't participate in some of the same plans that I offer to my employees on the same tax basis that a large employer could or a C Corp could. And so we have been long advocating, uh, as long as I remember now, about 35, 37 years, uh, we have been advocating for tax parity and how health and welfare benefits are offered, group health and life and disability, the ability to participate in a Section 125 cafeteria plan on the same basis as a large employer. Uh, that is work that still needs to be done, um, and it's absolutely uh, targeting small businesses in a negative way. The last area I'll, I'll touch upon is our policy around medical liability reform. We know that what's sometimes called defensive medicine is practiced um, in, in, in doctor's offices and hospitals. In order to, what ends up happening is um, additional tests, additional scans that may or may not be needed. Um, are often done at a cost to us indirectly uh, in the way of increased healthcare costs and overall healthcare costs. And we're dealing in an area that is currently about approaching 18% of our GDP. If we continue down this path, um, and it, this ties back to the costs of healthcare, we're going to have where one out of every five dollars on our economy is going into the healthcare sector. And I'm not sure how sustainable that is as a nation. To put it into perspective, the next highest uh, expending country is Canada at 9% of G their GDP. So we are currently all, almost double, and uh, we are double, and approaching uh, much more than that. Medical liability reform, our policy position is to look at how can we avoid having uh, providers order additional tests, additional exams, additional costs into the system. How can we instead build a, an affirmative defense that if they create, the, if they are able to properly diagnose and then provide a standard of care that is in line with that current diagnosis, they should be shielded from liability claims for bad outcomes. And that, we, that is going to be a heavy, uh, a heavy pull uh, to get across the finish line, but that's one that we are also involved in. It's related to the costs of healthcare, but it's also related into how our employees and their family members are, are treated um, in, within the healthcare system. With that, I, I wanna stop. There are lots of other issues that uh, touch on healthcare and small employer group plans. Maybe we can cover some of those in the uh, round table, but uh, that's kind of an overview. Thank you, that was, you really, that was really helpful. Thank you very much. Um, a good uh, level setting. And, I, and I'm going to bet to interest our, our, our guests here in just a moment, but I, there's a, just one thing I want to do first, and that is to kind of brief folks on a survey we just had in the field of small businesses. And I don't want to go through the whole thing. I don't want to spend time with it, but there are a couple of really interesting things that I'd like to kind of point out. Uh, Molly, if you wouldn't mind putting the survey up. Uh, I want to go first actually to the third, I believe it's the third slide, uh, where we look at the most significant challenges to the future growth and survival of your business. Um, what we see from folks is not surprisingly that economic uncertainty, uh, the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic and decline in consumer spending are, are the, sort of the top challenges. Obviously those are all interrelated with one another and reflect the times that we're in. 
Uh, but beyond that, what we see here is in terms of challenges to the survival of the business, the regulatory burdens, capital access, and tax burdens are now ahead of health uh, uh, costs and health insurance benefits uh, on that list. And that is new. And it, I've been doing this for years, and, and, I, and that health insurance costs have been at the top of that list for at least 20 years. Um, so this is a change that I think we need to think about what this means and what's happening in the health insurance markets. But it's also contrasted with the next uh, slide, Molly, if you don't mind going on uh, to the next, uh, uh, oh, excuse me, not the next one, but the final slide, the long-term priorities. So go advance one more. We ask what should the, what are long-term priorities? We ask them, uh, and number one, once again, with members is reining in health insurance costs. So in fact, it's it's sort of like they can divorce, uh, business owners can divorce themselves from the current, uh, you know, client, weird climate that we're in, think about what's gonna impact their business long-term, healthcare costs are still at the top of the list. And I just think that's a fascinating situation that we're in right now and that I don't want us to all misread. So uh, please look at the rest of the survey at your leisure. It's all, I think, in the packet that you were sent. There's lots of interesting stuff there in terms of how business owners are feeling about the climate they're in right now. Um, but uh, I think that will be helpful as we move forward. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our speakers now, uh, and I hope we're going to have a good, uh, I call them speakers, but we're actually, there are guests because we're going to have a, a dialogue, not a formal, not formal presentations per se. Um, but first off, I want to welcome Tom Wildsmith, who's with the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, uh, has deep expertise uh, in insurance issues, uh, is an actuary by profession. In fact, he's the past president of the American Academy of Actuaries. So he understands how these markets work, what the incentives are. Uh, and all of that. I think he can, he can, he'll be able to help us with that. Uh, he's Managing Director of Legislative and Regulatory Policy over at BCBSA. And then uh, we've got Dan Jones, who's the VP of Federal Affairs, the Alliance of Community Health Plans. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say many years ago was uh, Director of Government Affairs here at NSBA. So uh, he, uh, Dan, uh, knows not only the association, but the small business community really well. So I think that's a real asset for us today. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing his expertise. So maybe, you know, and Gary, just jump in here when you're ready, but I'll, maybe I'll just throw out the first um, overview question to both of you, whoever wants to answer first. And that is, you know, wh wh what will be the first thing this Congress administration really tackles in healthcare policy? Uh, and uh, especially if those things might have an impact on the small business market and healthcare costs overall. Um, and then I'll follow up with, and maybe that's not the first thing, but what's the most important thing they ought to be doing? Uh, this year. So who wants to start? Tom. Well, I, <laughs> thank you. I want to be careful because predicting what Congress is going to do is often a fool's errand. But I think we can all already see in the budget reconciliation language that's being marked up in the House um, as we speak, I believe, uh, the priorities and those are dealing with COVID, and fixing the ACA. And I think that makes sense. There was a lot of talk about public options and grand health care reform, but we're in an environment where with democratic control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, we can expect health care reform. But with a slim majority, it's going to have to be modest reform. And because, you know, there are some conservative Democrats that are just not going to get on board with Medicare for all. And they can't, so they can't get the votes. And that's why they're going through the reconciliation process. Um, so we're already seeing things in reconciliation like expanding the ACA tax credits, providing additional incentives to get um, more states to expand Medicaid. And I think we'll see more of that legislatively. And then on the administration side, I think we're going to see more aggressive regulatory and oversight actions. Um, I don't know, Dan, is, is that consistent with what you're seeing? Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be COVID, COVID, COVID. Um, it's imperative that the Biden administration come out in the first hundred days and do everything that they can to address that and be successful. Um, Congress is clearly 
aligned with that goal and is, um, as you pointed out, um, pursued the budget reconciliation route without really giving much consideration to a bipartisan um, approach, uh, knowing that they would never really get all that they wanted in the time that they wanted to do that. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm, I'm finding it a little interesting, kind of some of the things that they're putting in the budget reconciliation bill. We had heard early on that there wasn't going to be much health care in it, although I don't know how they kind of stay away from health care if they're addressing COVID and economic relief, because uh, it's all kind of intertwined. Um, but they do have another budget reconciliation bill coming up um, after this that they could uh, pursue and take on more health care issues. But I agree. I think it's it still gets into the moderate incremental type of changes into the ACA, um, Medicaid. Um, you know, they have the subsidization of COBRA. Um, and, um, and, then, and then we'll see what comes of it. I, I, you know, if you kind of look at a little bit more of the longer term picture here, all of this is temporary assistance. It's a, a two year bump in ACA subsidies. Um, so, you know, what type of cliff does that set up? What type of pressure and momentum can that give them a year from now or at that second budget reconciliation bill to not let people that have uh, been getting new benefits then lose them, um, you know, after that time period ends? So we're seeing that a little bit with a public health emergency declaration and the Medicaid bump. Uh, a lot of our plans have seen increases in their roles on Medicaid. Uh, but then after the public health emergency uh, declaration ends, what's going to happen there? Do you really think that that's, um, they're viewing this as temporary increases or whether that's just an artifact of the, the scoring process and the budgetary rules around reconciliation? It probably is more of a, a, a function of that. And obviously we all know that um, on the Dem side of the aisle, they have for a long time wanted to uh, strengthen and expand the ACA. And here's their opportunity to do it in this space. And, um, but you know, they won't walk away from it, right? I, I see a lot of temporary changes. Um, take a look at the National Emergency Declaration last March 13th that now affects COBRA. If I'm a larger small employer, um, I have obligations where the uh, timelines in COBRA elections and payments are paused. What a lot of folks in Washington are not aware of is under the National Emergencies Act, um, because President Trump in mid-December did not provide the proper notice, that expires March 13th. And even though it's likely we're still in the middle of COVID, um, all of those COBRA rules that came out from the three agencies, DOL, IRS, and HHS, um, expire. And uh, the pause button will be unpaused come May. That's going to have an impact. You saw in the... Um, early actions in the Biden administration, the temporary reopening of the exchanges starting next week and running into May. Um, I think you're going to see short-term actions to try to provide health care both to individuals and employers. And one of my hopes uh, for uh, NSBA is to be a, an advocate to remind uh, our uh, rule makers and our legislators that one of the greatest ways we can provide greater access uh, to individuals is through small business plans. Yeah, we've no. been talking to the tri-agencies about that COBRA guidance. Our reading of the statute is that it should expire after 12 months, but it's it's been surprising that the agencies haven't issued any guidance around that expiration. And one thing to watch is if the COBRA language makes it through reconciliation, it's got some interesting provisions. If somehow they keep that uh, DOL guidance in place, extend it past the 12 months, we need to think really carefully about how it interacts with uh, uh, COBRA provisions in the reconciliation bill. If you remember back to 2008, 2009, during the Great Recession, um, COBRA actually had subsidies. The feds provided mm -hmm. subsidies to all employers, large and small, to keep people on COBRA uh, because of the job loss and then the related insurance uh, losses. But 
overlaying all of this is I'm sitting back waiting for the Supreme Court to give us a decision on the uh, Texas case. And uh, do we have an ACA or if not, uh, I think unlikely, but in this court, I, I'm not putting down any bets in Las Vegas on how they're about to rule. Uh, if the ACA is declared unconstitutional in whole, I would expect Congress the next day to be starting on a reintroduction of large swaths of the ACA. I can't imagine going back to a pre-2010 world in healthcare. One thing I think that um, isn't perhaps well recognized among a lot of people is insurance carriers have let their underwriters go. Uh, they don't have policies filed under the old rules. It's not like you could flip a switch and go back to the pre-ACA system. We've scrapped that system. Um, so I think everyone would be desperate for Congress to fix it. I, I agree. It's, I guess the, uh, the actuaries out there with the short-term plans would probably have a premium uh, rate for themselves <laughs> going forward. But um, yeah, yeah, I agree. I think the world will get flipped upside down if the Supreme Court comes down with a decision that um, invalidates um, uh, and, and the severability clause in particular um, aspects of the law. Well, I has a quick question before we get too far. I have, first, I have some housekeeping. Just remind people, we're going to try to get to as many of your questions as we can. So if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, not the chat. We're monitoring this Q&A, so it looks like people are doing a good job of that. We already asked some good questions, but if you have some, put them there, and we'll we'll read out as many of them as we can. Uh, but B, we're already seeing some of these changes right now. Uh, I mean, we're saying that that you know President Biden reopened the open enrollment for folks. Uh, we're talking about additional subsidies uh, for insurance. Will, will the, how will these things play out in the individual and small group markets? Should we expect? The subsidies put downward pressure on premiums. Should we expect the open enrollment to put upward pressure on premiums? Um, will either one be enough that most business owners will notice? What should we expect sort of from the market uh, as these policies go into effect, do you think, over the next year or so? Well, Tom, let me kick this one off because you're going to have the expertise here to, um, I wouldn't be able to follow you on this one. Um, I'll, I'll say this, um, our, our plans and the Alliance of Community Health Plans have been supportive of uh, the administration's special enrollment period for, for people that um, can get back into the market if they weren't able to do it during open enrollment at the end of last year. Um, and many state-based exchanges have been leaving their um, uh, open enrollment uh, running or, or their um, coming in, you know, picking up what the federal facilitated exchanges are doing with open enrollment. Um, with that all being said, I, I think there are some questions and I would be interested to hear what Tom would have to say about this um, in regard to some of the changes that are proposed in the Ways and Means Bill for the increase in subsidies or moving the, uh, the subsidy cliff <clears throat> and the ability for people to switch plan levels, different metal levels within open enrollment that's now open to the extent that those collide um, and, and I think that's what the, the, it's envisioned, um, what type of impact that has on the market. And I think it just depends on what market you're in uh, on the exchange side of things. Um, but uh, I, I, that, that's a question that our members have been pondering right now and trying to get their heads around in terms of uh, the potential for kind of manipulation in the marketplace. Um, and with that in mind, I, I think that, you know, we would like to to see some acknowledgement of that uh, as Congress is moving forward with uh, increasing subsidies during a new open enrollment period and considering what type of guardrails can be put in place to ensure that there's some stability in the market moving forward. Yeah, I think that's a great, great question. And I think I agree with basically everything you've said. We don't see this open enrollment creating a lot of disruption. Uh, we have to remember, we just had an open enrollment. So um, there are not a lot of people out there who haven't had a chance to get into the market and, and want to. 
um, if we if we started doing special open enrollments three times a year on a predictable basis, then maybe people might start sitting out the market and waiting until they had an, an urgent need. But doing this once in the middle of the pandemic, um, I, I don't think that disrupts anything. In general, the uh, higher the subsidies, the more representative slice of the population you expect to sign up. It just makes it a better deal for healthier and younger people to enter the market. Um, so in general, I think broader subsidies, as long as they're well designed, are, are going to help and maybe not make a dramatic increase, um, dramatic impact on gross premium levels. Although if you get some healthier people, it, it should bring them down some. Um, more importantly, it's going to lower the net premiums that consumers are facing. Um, is, is that consistent with the way you're viewing it? Yeah, I think that's right. I, you know, we just kind of hear a mixed bag of experiences. Um, you know, some plans in state-based exchanges that have had open, that did an open enrollment last year did not see um, a dramatically different risk profile um, in terms of the numbers of people that entered into the market at that time. Um, we've heard concerns from uh, from other markets. Um, you know, if you look at South Texas or um, maybe some other states that, um, that the state is not operating the exchange in the state, just depending on the dynamics, they may feel like there could be a bigger a uh, population of uninsured that never elected to go in and maybe the the new um, increased subsidies incentivize them to do so. But I, I agree. I, I don't I don't know if it really moves the needle all that much and, and um, the experiences that we have to date suggest otherwise, but um, there certainly is some um, I don't know if it's PTSD from from years prior or not, but uh, some concern around the potential for adverse selection in that case. Mm -hmm. One of the things we saw in this last year's open enrollment and renewals from a lot of small group plans were uh, basically very small increases and in a lot of numbers of cases, decreases in healthcare, small decreases in healthcare premiums. And I think, Todd, to answer your question about the short term, and this would be very short term uh, during COVID times, Remember that uh, a lot of providers were not doing elective surgeries. Uh, the hospitals, in fact, were, uh, and uh, ambulatory, ambulatory uh, service centers were, mm -hmm. were not allowed in, by state uh, uh, mandates to do those types of elective surgeries. And so a lot of groups, uh, what even community rated groups, uh, were seeing decreases in uh, premiums. I think that short term, and I'm concerned a year after, two years after uh, the end of the pandemic, uh, what happens to all that backlog of elective surgeries? And what, is that, what impact does that have on our group, group costs? Yeah. I'm sure that, go ahead, go ahead Tom. Well, I was just gonna say that's a real concern and different plans that I've talked to have different forward projections. Um, I think pretty much everyone saw a decrease uh, due to COVID in 2020. Most people are expecting an increase in 2021. When you combine 2020 and 2021, um, most of the plans I've spoken to expect um, a, a net impact somewhere in the low single digits. Whether that's positive or negative depends on their particular market and, and experience. Is, is that consistent with what you're hearing? Yeah, Tom, I was going to say, I, was, I would defer to you from the, um, the actuary's line of sight, um, but it is consistent that there has obviously been some deferred care uh, this year. And mm -hmm. my understanding is that there are questions about, um, you know, when will they realize the, the other side of that? Is it this year or is it going to be 2022? Right. Well, that's actually a good opportunity for us to sort of get some feedback from, from the folks who are participating in the, in the session today. Because the question always arise, arises, what a small, how do small businesses respond 
to higher premiums or changes in the marketplace? And so I actually want to sort of ask people that question, sort of what are the factors um, that is important in determining where they offer, how they offer, um, and uh, how they adjust when, when, when they're faced with, uh, uh, with changes. So uh, panels can't vote, but if everyone else who's on the line, if you're, if you're uh, uh, as you said, this materials that went out, if you uh, are coming in through the app, you can vote. Unfortunately, if you're on the web browser version of, of Ring Central, it's not possible to vote, unfortunately. That's just the way the system is designed. Uh, and I apologize for that, but that's, uh, uh, so if, if people just sort of take and choose what are the most important factors here for them, um, we'll give you a few seconds to vote and then we'll look at the results and, and kind of talk about what that means. Got a few go responses still trickling in, so let's give it yeah. 10 more seconds and then we'll close All it right. down. Great. And just to remind who we're waiting, uh, uh, chat is just that, it is just to chat. So if you, have, if you have a question you want to get addressed in the Q&A, do it in the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So, and we'll close it down now, share the results. Yeah, so obviously the cost of the plan is the single biggest factor, but um, just below that are, are the benefits. And so um, uh, I would think that's where folks would go first trying to figure out how to adjust the plan. Um, uh, uh, they would want to maintain the specific set of benefits they're looking for. So, but yeah, nothing is more important than the cost, which I actually is, is goes along with everything else that we have, that we have seen. So, you know, what does, what, what does that mean in terms of federal policy? Do you think the, um, we, we there's been a lot of talk as you, as you as we already alluded to to a public option, um, and uh, we realize that uh, there are particular sets of benefits that people are looking for. Um, uh, how do we maintain a, a a private system in the face of these various pressures? Um, well, I, I was interested by that. Um, by that poll, because uh, the way that I look at it is that the cost is reflective of all these other um, yeah. questions that you asked, right? It's um, the benefits, the network, and right. um, maybe a couple of those were outside of that purview, but it's, um, and it kind of gets to a, the point I think that I would say, which is um, there's no silver bullet uh, to address cost. I think it's, uh, an ongoing issue that has to constantly be addressed because there's different incentives in the marketplace that um, various stakeholders will, will find. And so you, <laughs> there's just kind of some moving goalposts right. with it. Um, you know, with respect to the public option, I, I think it's just a direct reflection of affordability. We wouldn't have to have a conversation around having the government um, uh, put a, a product out that's lower cost than everything else if uh, everything else was a little bit lower in cost. So whether or not it's a public option or Medicare for all or Medicare for some or um, whatever that solution is, I think we have to drive towards affordability. And I think there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, the member plans that I represent have a strong tie to their providers. And, and in many instances, they're fully integrated and have um, advocated for a long time in the affordability and quality space for a greater um, intense effort towards uh, moving the delivery system towards value instead of volume. Um, and that's something that uh, we have focused on. But I think that there's a number of things um, out there that can help uh, get us towards a greater affordability, uh, including improving the risk pools, looking at prescription drug cost, um, as well as you know perhaps factors in the community that fall into the bucket of social determinants of health that can help manage cost. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll end there and see, Tom, I don't know if you agree with that or have any other um, thoughts to add. Yeah, I agree with that. The one thing I would add is that a public option is not a silver bullet either. And the modeling I've seen the the models that predict a big savings for a public option are all implicitly assuming that they pay providers less. 
usually paying them at, at Medicare rates or some modest increase over Medicare rates. If you model a public option paying providers at, at commercial rates, you don't get the savings, or at least not a significant savings. And you see the, the political challenge there. Um, if, if Congress were to write a bill with public option, there would be tremendous pushback from providers on um, the payment rates if they were significantly reduced. The other thing you notice is that the, um, the score is going to, going to skyrocket if you start pulling significant enrollment out of large employers. So those are the two cost things to watch with a public option. And like I said, my sense is in the current Congress, given the, the amount of disruption involved and, and the kind of CBO scores you'd be seeing, it's much more likely that they're going to go down the ACA fix route than try and pass a public option. You know, an, an election down the road, who knows? Um, I don't know. Is, is that consistent or, with what you're thinking? Or what if there's it, the, the Supreme Court decision does uh, uh, kick out the ACA and they have to start over again. Then what options are suddenly on the table that might not be on the table at an incremental approach? What do you think the big fights would be then? Uh, would a public option be much more on the table than it is otherwise? I, I would answer yes. And you have to go back in history and not that far. It's only uh, 11 and 12 years ago that we were debating the ACA. And the Dems at the time, who had a, a supermajority in the Senate uh, and a, a large majority in the House and controlled the White House, uh, discussed the public option. But if you recall, on both the um, uh, Recovery Act and on the ACA, the Dems negotiated at length with Republicans. There were over 100 uh, Republican amendments adopted mm -hmm. into the what eventually became the ACA. Um, and not a single Republican in the House or Senate voted for the overall ACA. The Dems, I'm afraid, in this Congress have learned a lesson that you don't, in essence, negotiate with yourself, remove things that you might support. And one of my concerns is that if the ACA is thrown out, I don't think it's going to occur. But if the ACA is thrown out, I think the Dems learned a lesson about uh, bipartisanship from uh, both the Recovery Act and the ACA. And I would not be surprised to see a public option in a reconciliation bill that doesn't require a 60-vote uh, majority in the Senate. Um, I, just a couple of thoughts about that. One of those Republican amendments kicked themselves off of the FEHBP, which I always find kind of funny. Um, and, and it put them into the private market and they ended up having a bunch of uh, hoopla about that. Um, I, you know, I, I've, also, I've also wondered, you know, could Congress step in and put a dollar uh, tax on the individual mandate and then, um, and then remove the issues, you know, with respect to the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court, if we're going down this road, if they were to strike down the entire ACA, I can't see them um, starting over from ground zero, uh, considering all the systems that are in place. So I imagine there's a right. different starting point. And you're right, they would still have to go through budget reconciliation and they would have to get buy-in from the likes of, of, of Joe Manchin and and several others just to get to the 50, which is going to be incredibly difficult. And I wonder about a public option ever um, reaching that threshold. Yeah. And I don't know about the, the bird rules around the public option and whether, whether or not it could sustain uh, in that regard. I think there's a lot of questions around it. It's yeah. fun to think about. Yeah. yeah, the bird rule would be a, a challenge for the public option. And, and the saving grace may be that the Affordable Care Act's already been written. If they truly need to get something in place fast enough um, to protect people's coverage before the end of the year. The easiest thing would be to repass what they've, they've already done. done. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I want to get other people involved in here. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Jody Milanese, our, our VP for Government Affairs, has been kind of monitoring the Q and A's and ask her to sort of ask some questions. Um, but just quickly, I, I want to make sure uh, you know not everyone who's on the line is spooled up on uh, federal affairs as we all are. So just just FYI, the bird rule is the rule that requires uh, anything from reconciliation be reconciliation bill to be germane, to be relevant to the tax and spending packages that the, that are that bill is supposed to be for. Um, so, Judy, are there any questions that uh, you have for us? Yes, absolutely. We've gotten a number of questions that have come in, including several on this topic. Um, from This one comes from Timmy and Rita. They ask, with the influx of all hours clinics that are staffed by physician assistants and trained nurses, is there any discussion on greater utilization of clinics which offer monthly memberships? Well, I can, I can start to address it. Um, there's a whole category of what's sometimes referred to as concierge medicine, where uh, a, a, a single doc or a, a practice or a clinic decides they're not going to accept um, commercial insurance. Uh, a lot of, not a lot of folks, uh, a growing number of those folks are declining to participate in Medicare um, because of the Medicare reimbursement rates. Medicaid reimbursement rates tend to be even lower than the Medicare reimbursement rates in many states. Um, and so our, this, this whole idea of uh, direct contracting. It's been around for about 15, 20 years now. Um, I, every once in a while, I'll see a little bit of growth in that area. Um, unfortunately, for most small employers, uh, the, the ability to offer that as a benefit uh, is, is a little bit more limited uh, if you want to offer it on a tax-free or tax-favored uh, basis. Um, but I suspect if costs continue to grow at the rates they had grown pre-COVID, um, you may see more and more of that. And it's, it's interesting to me to note that, you know, when we talk small businesses, take hospitals outside, outside of it, a lot of medical practices and some of these clinics are small businesses in and of themselves. But we are tending to look at it predominantly not through their eyes as much as a uh, you know a manufacturing and other service sector providers purchase of, of uh, health coverage for their employees. I've got a kind of a follow up question for you, if you don't mind. Um, are you seeing this more less as a replacement for the primary group health plan and more as a replacement for the on site health clinic that a lot of larger employers tend to have? It's almost all in the large, all of that activity is occurring in the very large employer sector, you know, the Fortune 500 sized companies. Um, interestingly, I had just spoken with a uh, Delaware uh, physician practice that's trying to establish um, a roving on site geared at small to mid sized employers. So, not a, not a, you know, three shifts a day, 24 7 operation um, and they were interested in you know would would smaller to mid-sized employers be interested in offering that and I didn't have a good answer for them but I thought it was an interesting idea we'll see what what happens I, I think it's all driven by healthcare costs what can a smaller employer you know, afford to offer to their employees yeah, and, and and what do they need, right? I, I've always kind of thought of concierge medicine and direct contracting is that the jury's still out a little bit on it. Um, you know, it could work for some people, but not everyone. And um, and it probably just depends on where you are and, and what you need and, and the construct of business that you're in or not. Um, it brings to mind a couple of other things kind of not necessarily related, but I think in part, which is um, some focus on primary care. Um, which I think is a good thing. Um, and, you know, being able to access care out, outside of uh, high cost uh, areas like emergency rooms and other things, which I think is also another um, uh, good trend. Obviously, during the pandemic, the use of 
telemedicine has, has been something that I think anecdotally we could point to as another tool in the toolbox to help lower cost, um, expanding the uh, types of providers that can uh, provide telemedicine under the public health uh, emergency has been good and we would like to see those um, continuing forward. I think part of that is actually at each state level uh, in the scope of practice definitions. You know, there are some states that allow PAs and nurse practitioners, uh, advanced practice providers to uh, hang out their own shingle. Uh, and they are typically anywhere from 70 to 80% of the cost of physicians, obviously. Many state medical societies are not so keen on expanding scope of, uh, scope of practice. Um, but there, there's lots of things going on in, in both Washington and our state capitals that small employers should be paying attention to. Okay. Let's see if we get some more questions here. Jerry, is there a lot of stuff we need to address here? Sure. Um, Gregory asks, has there ever been a national standardized healthcare cost worksheet is there any discussion on implementing it? And wouldn't that empower the individual? Sure, it's called Medicare. Um, we've had it now for uh, what, 46 years? Um, interestingly, and- 56, I, I, Gary. 56 years, <laughs> I just did quick math. Yeah. Um, which is why I'm not an actuary, Tom. Uh, the, uh, Interestingly, in 2003, when Medicare Part D was put in place, Congress at the president's behest specifically excluded the ability of the federal government in Medicare to negotiate on prescription drug costs mm -hmm. um, and to use the Medicare clout uh, to negotiate lower uh, drug costs. Uh, in most plans today that I look at, prescription drugs account for a roughly a third of the overall healthcare costs, and it's growing. It's growing even faster than physician and hospital costs. And so do we see a Congress maybe saying, uh, you know, removing that restriction of, of the feds negotiating prescription drug costs? It would reduce, for Medicare recipients, reduce costs. If you tie that to some form of Medicare for some or a public option, you now have national standard pricing, uh, which will not make uh, most pharmacy pharmacists or pharmaceutical firms um, very happy. You don't um, necessarily have to have the public option to get it into the commercial space. I think over the last couple of years, there was some discussion around letting the commercial side piggyback onto some of those government negotiation prices. But um, yeah, it's a very uh, nuanced conversation in the drug space and certainly pharma is, um, I hate saying 110% because that's not real, but 110% focused on it. <laughs> yeah, and I, can I just say working in the government affairs realm, Pharma is really, really, really good with their advocacy. Um, so just be aware of that. With that said, I think that Congress made a lot of headway in the last Congress in many regards in a bipartisan way towards drug pricing. Mm -hmm. The Senate Finance Committee produced a bipartisan bill. The Health Committee had a bill that had a lot of provisions that get to uh, drug pricing issues. And of course, the House produced a bill that included the um, government negotiation piece that was partisan, um, but I, but I, you know, I, the issue is not going to go away, Gary. To your point, that it continues to be rising cost, um, new drugs being developed, which is a good thing to help address, um, you know, individuals' needs. Um, but we do have to get our head around how do we manage this in a way that makes it um, affordable and reasonable. Yeah, don't you think that with the uh, new Congress and the new administration, it's more likely that we'll see pharmacy legislation? I think there's more of an opportunity than there was in the last Congress, guaranteed, yes. And, I mean, you, you can go back. It's a very bipartisan uh, concern. Uh, you saw President Trump do an executive order on prescription drug costs. So I, I wouldn't... Uh, foresee that being off the table despite, and I agree with you, Tom, 
uh, pharma's amazing presence uh, in government affairs in DC. The questions are kind of piling up on us now, so let's let's see if we can get some more in there, Jody. They certainly are. Um, <laughs> speaking of telemedicine and remote patient monitoring, do you see any movement to provide broader reimbursements for R RPM, particularly those related to chronic diseases? So let, let me just throw a wrinkle in there um, that we, we're short term we're dealing with, and that is the um, tax code currently does not allow for um, certain uh, telemed with which would have a pre, if I wanna have a high deductible health plan and contribute to an HSA, the current tax code does not allow me to offer telemed except as a um, post-deductible, post-high deductible plan. And telemed isn't designed that way. It's, it's really designed as the replacement for an office visit. Um, and so I think there's needed action here. We, we got it in the COVID uh, relief partial, but that is a major concern. You know, great, I, you can provide me with telemed as a part of my group health plan, but now it disqualifies me or my employer from offering, uh, making contributions to an HSA. Yeah, that's, that's a big issue. Um, and I don't think we're good at distinguishing between what telemed is, is preventive and what telemed isn't. On the cost issue, one of the inside political fights is the provider groups very much want payment parity for telemed. Um, in other words, they want to be paid as much for a virtual visit as they would be for a face-to-face -face visit in the clinic or in the office. Um, and that, if, if that's put into legislation or regulation, it's going to preclude some of the potential savings we might otherwise expect from moving to, to a greater use of telemedicine. And the counter argument to that is telemed is great for certain things, but when the provider has to put hands on the patient, that's really hard to do with technology today. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, you know, I, I, I used to watch Star Trek as a kid. They could do all sorts of things uh, uh, medically. Maybe when we get to that point, uh, we'll, be, we'll be fine. But telemed is not an overall replacement for the office visit, uh, at least in the short to midterm. I don't Right, but if we're smart about it, it could help with chronic diseases. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say I agree with everything that you said, and that I think the upside is incredible for remote patient monitoring, keeping people um, at home, and and the technology space there. Of course, growing technology comes with um, additional cost in many respects, but I, I think that it's a very a very bright kind of um, silver lining to all of that. Next question. Uh, sure. This this participant asks, can you talk about the risks and benefit of small businesses self-insuring and paying for healthcare services for employees as needed? So I, I, I can start with an overarching, but I'm, there, there's going to be a caveat coming. Um, when you self-insure, depending upon your size, um, you often will buy uh, certain types of what's called stop loss. You'll sometimes hear it referred to as reinsurance, but technically it's stop loss coverage, either specific stop loss for any one claim and aggregate stop loss for claims across the group as a whole. If I'm a small employer, um, yes, it, it, the way the current law is established, I can set up a self-funded plan uh, where I or I hire a third-party administrator, uh, sometimes an insurance company's uh, claims department, sometimes an independent uh, TPA, to adjudicate my claims and pay them. 
The difficulty is, and the caveat is, some states have now legislated the level you must have of, in, in particular, specific stop loss. Mm -hmm. So, you know, theoretically, I could have a plan where my specific stop loss began at my deductible level, $2,800. Um, and I could probably find some stop loss carrier to write it down to $2,800 or $5,000 or $10,000. Some states um, have pushed back on that. And without getting into the weeds, have said, no, you have to have a level, a minimum level. You cannot write stop loss carrier in our state. Coverage uh, for specific stop loss below, I've seen it as low as 50,000, but typically $100,000. Well, if I'm a five person, 10 person, 20 person firm, I could bankrupt myself by not being able to, to have to pay the first $100,000 of a claim. You know, if my annual revenues are half a million or a million, and I'm a service industry, a $100,000 claim is gonna wipe me out, one claim, and I'm gonna be bankrupt. So there are some practical limitations, but there's nothing in ERISA at the federal level that wouldn't prevent a two-person, five-person firm from self-funding Practically, it may be difficult, and in some states, it would be not impossible, but not feasible. Okay, thanks. What else have, Jody? Sure. Uh, let's move on. Um, uh, Sidaya asks, what is Congress doing about hospital price transparency? Well, part of the CAA, the, the act that was passed last year, uh, signed into law by the president on December 27th, that gave all employers four days to fix a lot of things um, or make some decisions. But you weren't doing anything else anyway. Don't worry about it. Did create some price transparency. Now in the law, uh, there is some price transparency. The law, however, like many laws, those of you who believe that um, the schoolhouse rock, how a bill becomes a law, um, it, it's not really. The law was fairly general and leaves to um, the regulatory agencies the writing of the rules. So we are going to wait and see what kind of regulations, both initially proposed and then final, uh, come out, but there is meant to be some price transparency, and it flows through to those of you that have insured group health plans, it flows through to the, your insurance carriers. And if you're self-funded, it flows through to your TPA. And so while many of us don't have, in the small employer marketplace, don't have access, eventually, under the law now, um, it'll flow through your plans, through the carriers and TPAs, mm -hmm. directly to your employees. At, at Dan oh. or Tom, have you had a chance to look at the legislation and see what oh. kind of impact it's gonna have on your plans? Our plans are really focused at, um, with a lot of the um, executive order and regulations on price transparency from um, during the Trump administration. And uh, despite the hospital's best efforts through the legal system to uh, stop the implementation of uh, some of the uh, regulations that came forward, uh, they uh, began, I believe, January 1st of uh, this year. So a lot of uh, hospitals are having to post um, uh, shoppable services on their website um, and in a machine readable format so that uh, presumably some technology companies would be able to engage in, in that and provide some value to consumers. But I think the current um, layout of that type of information and the volume of it and the, um, the just the arcane nature of hospital pricing um, is not necessarily adding so much of a consumer benefit. And, you know, one of the things that, and, and there'll be similar type of regulations on uh, insurers to provide uh, uh, transparency and price with their negotiated rates with hospitals. Um, but I'm not sure if that is going to provide the 
um, the value to consumers that uh, you know initially the, the, the intention was, and, and maybe over a period of time with the engagement of the technology sector there is, um, but uh, you know for a, a long period of time, health plans have advocated for price transparency to consumers in a meaningful way so that it allows them to shop by services within the context mm -hmm. of their health plan uh, and where they sit within their deductible. So it's one thing to know what the price of a knee replacement is at the hospital in uh, Springfield, Illinois, but it's not very useful to you if you don't have a health plan uh, that would cover the cost of the product there or, or the, or the uh, procedure there. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think to the extent that these machine readable files have any benefit to consumers, it's going to be through an intermediary like Consumers Reports or a local newspaper that goes through and analyzes the data and provides some high level information in a way that um, real people like, like you and me can, can use. It's interesting to me that there, on, on another employee benefit on retirement plans, during the Obama administration, we were required to uh, show our employees what the costs, the various uh, hidden and not so hidden fees in retirement plans were in annual disclosures uh, to employees. And our experience in that area is the employee gets it along with the other 62, and I'm not exaggerating, 62 annual notices for their benefit plans and never reads them. We haven't seen changes based on the data that are now being provided in, in transparency. I don't know if that carries over into the healthcare realm. You know, is there such a thing as like a good RX version of hospital and provider costs at some point, not just prescription costs, but we're not, we're nowhere near there yet. I think there are a lot of unintended consequences around the, the notion of providing transparency and um, it, it's, it's just makes it all that much more important to get it right and make it meaningful. Yeah. Roger, I think we've got time for a couple more questions before we need to let folks go and move on to our uh, other business here today. Okay, great. Um, Helen, Helen mentions that uh, mid-year healthcare changes have been allowed due to the coronavirus, giving employers you know, a one-time pass to allow them to make changes um, without it being open enrollment. Do you see um, this mid-year open enrollment period continuing beyond um, the pandemic? No. If the question yeah. is post-pandemic, are we likely to see the, the the technical name or special enrollment periods. Um, they exist within HIPAA, where if I have a certain uh, type of change of status event, I'm allowed mid-year to come in and make changes within my health plan. Mm -hmm. I can add a spouse, I can uh, uh, add a new child, a, a new dependent child. There, there are all sorts of uh, special enrollment periods that we've been living with for uh, over a decade in uh, HIPAA, but on the exchange or marketplace, and again, if the ACA is thrown out, I presume the exchange is gone, that's part of the ACA, um, but there, I'm not sure there's necessarily a public policy reason to maintain mid-year open enrollments short of um, the regular HIPAA special enrollment periods. Yeah, I think it's unlikely those open enrollment periods that you see in HEPA were standard practice for employer group plans back in the 80s. Uh, they just make sense. If someone has a child or their spouse dies or um, what have you, you pretty much have to let them make a change. But it doesn't make good financial sense to let people change mid-year if there's not a um, quote, good reason for it. Right. Okay. Um, One more. Sure, we've gotten some questions in about uh, Medi Medicare expansion. Uh, Bradley and Michael ask, it's a growing part of states' budgets and it is unsustainable. 
Furthermore, many plans aren't as comprehensive as private plans and doctors sometimes prefer to treat Medicare patients. How can we address this issue? Right. Well, I think there's a couple of things to pull together there. One is the sort of the, the Medicare benefits and the other is the Medicaid impact on state budgets, but they're both real things. So who wants to take either or both of those? Anyone? I'm not sure that Medicare is going to, Medicare doesn't uh, impact the states other than through their right. own employees uh, right. and retiree health plans and right. such. But I think the question was about the benefits, but because I think there are a number of employers I, I, that I've talked to who uh, have their employees who are, who are Medicaid, Medicare eligible, but choose to stay on their private health insurance because the benefits are so much better than the Medicare benefits. Well, there, there's a law that we've had for uh, decades now um, on, and it, it, it impacts small employers because the threshold is at 20 employees total. But the uh, Medicare, Medicare secondary payer rules do not allow an employer with 20 or more employees. It's any combination. It's, it, you're counting belly buttons here, not full-time, part and mm -hmm. separate, not counting part-time or, or seasonal. If I have 20 or more employees, um, I am prohibited from offering any direct or indirect incentive for that employee to take Medicare over my group health plan once they right. become Medicare eligible. Put aside the end-stage renal disease under age 65 people. Um, but it was very much a common practice uh, decades back yeah. that when one of my employees turned 65 or had a dependent who turned 65, hey, I'll give you an extra 500 bucks a year if you don't take our health plan and, and enroll your, yourself or your spouse in, the, uh, in Medicare. Mm -hmm. um, under 20 employees, 19 or fewer, I am allowed to do that. I, I could offer, I have to do it through a, a certain type of Section 125 plan, but I can offer an incentive uh, for that employee to not take my group health plan. 20 or more, I'm not allowed to by law. And there are now, uh, there have been filings with CMS uh, for, for decades that um, they cross-reference. So if you did that and have an active employee, 65 or older, and you happen to, um, Medicare got hit with a large bill, Medicare sends you, the employer, the bill. And it doesn't go to your insurer because that employee wasn't eligible, wasn't covered under the insurance plan, and you end up with that bill. So I, I'd be, we caution employers, small employers, yeah. 20 or more. Yeah, um, make sure. Doing uh, that. I was just going to add on the Medicaid side, uh, you know, it's a rock and a hard spot for states. They don't, mm -hmm. they can't deficit spend when the economy goes down during, uh, like it has during the pandemic and they're in, in their, uh, their revenues are going down. Um, you, you know, more people are getting onto the Medicaid programs. It's just a, it's a tough situation. Uh, Congress has worked to try to, um, it's a help in some regards in, in that kind of way. But uh, ultimately, the state, you know, there is a federal uh, floor, if you will, around Medicaid benefits, but the states have a lot of flexibility on, on what they try to provide uh, and at what cost. But that, that's a, that's, it's just a tough situation. Yeah, if the ACA were overturned and we started from scratch, I suspect that Congress would move to either lower the eligibility for the ACA coverage or put in some sort of federal backstop for those expansion populations. Um, because I think it's been a real frustration for the Democrats that many states haven't expanded Medicaid. Yep. All right. I think with that, uh, uh, gentlemen, I think we're going to end this part of the discussion. We really appreciate you taking the time and, and sharing your expertise with us today. Um, we're enormously grateful um, to have, it, have had this dialogue. Um, and uh, so I guess, Tom and Dan, you're, you can go on your way if you, if you would like and get on with your, uh, I know, very busy days. Um, most you. of us are just, thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you, buddy. And uh, the rest of us are going to stay here and talk a little bit about priorities for the organization. This, this conference is designed uh, to, uh, usually it's in person, but what we do is we work through these individual issues 
uh, issue areas and culminate in an overall priority agenda for the association uh, long term. As ML Mackey, our chair, said at the beginning, those priorities are a guide star. They're not totally dispositive. Things arise. There are issues we have to be involved in that we didn't foresee as a priority, uh, you know, a year before or, or whatever. Um, so, so I don't want people to think that there's, there's, you know, not an opportunity to th consider things that aren't prioritized. But we definitely use these prioritizations to allocate resources, to focus our committees, and to, and to focus the, the the media and the world and the and policymakers on the important uh, priorities of the small business community. So, I mean, in this area, uh, we want to take a minute to sort of uh, get your feedback on on those particular things that you think would be most useful uh, to address the, the you know, small businesses, health insurance quantities right now. Um, uh, and uh, I guess I'm gonna put, the, put the, uh, the ballot up on the screen, but basically uh, there's a, a lot of movement. We've been a big advocate in the past of greater consumer involvement and empowerment that, that, that is to, to you know, use the, the direct marketplace as opposed to only third party Payers to uh, to create better incentives. Uh, and part of that is the second thing, which is much greater transparency in costs. We had some discussion earlier about 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 the, the problems with that and how we actually use that and the need for uh, some interpretation. Uh, but nevertheless, that can be a really important tool. The other is uh, bringing down prescription drug prices and creating incentives for those prices to be lower. Uh, the other is the, is the thing that uh, Gary Kushner specifically mentioned earlier, which is the premium ratios. The, right now, uh, health insurance is, is priced within ratios based on age, and that makes keeps uh, premiums within some reason for older uh, individuals, but makes them more expensive than they otherwise would have been for, for lower cost and younger people, which may keep some of them out of the market. Um, the other, then, then there's the employer mandate, which is still in the law for companies that have more than 50 employees. There is a required participation level, which is complex and, and we think counterproductive uh, that should be removed. Um, there are limits on, on health related savings accounts that are, that are artificial and probably, don't, probably discourage consumer involvement. Uh, there's the, the aspect that uh, the self-employed are not allowed to deduct against, against self-employed, uh, self-employment taxes, the cost of their own health insurance. Uh, make, just, just making that change alone and bring equity to the system so that they have the same tax treatment as every other worker uh, would save the self-employed 15% on their own health insurance costs right up front, which would be a huge savings. Um, the other is to, is to think about reinstating the force behind the individual mandate. Um, and it's not clear how much, how much that would affect the market right now, but if you were to, uh, you know, put the penalties back. It does bring more of the uh, uh, of the the younger, better risks back into the insurance pool, and helps reduce rates for everyone else, and makes the markets more viable. Uh, and then finally, the idea of a public option, uh, uh, whether that's a, uh, something that you think actually could be a good thing, uh, or are there other things that are that you think are, are prioritized. So take a minute. Um, and, and on this particular poll, you can choose two of those uh, uh, that you think are the most important. Um, and uh, we'll take just a, a, a few seconds here and let everyone vote and see what the results are. We're still getting quite a few responses, so we'll keep the line open for just another right. few few seconds. Again, I, I apologize, those of you who are on the web browser aren't able to vote. Um, but uh, if you're on a future one of these and you're able to download the app uh, so you can vote, that would be uh, uh, a key thing to do. We'll give it 10 more seconds in case there are any stragglers out there. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close it now. Okay. All right, so as we see, folks are big fans of, of greater transparency. 
followed pretty closely by uh, 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 greater consumer involvement and uh, allowing the self-employed to fully deduct all their healthcare costs against self-employment taxes. Um, so those I mean, those make a great deal of sense to me. The first, uh, the consumer involvement, the transparency go hand in glove with one another, and the and the current discrimination really against the self-employed is a basic inequity in the, in both our tax and healthcare systems that we've been strong advocates to address for quite some time now. Um, so this is tremendously helpful, and we will get this, we will forward this information on for the for the culminating session of the of the Small Business Congress on February 23rd. Just so you all know, the six sessions that we're having leading up are only open to 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 NSB's leadership council. These are leadership events uh, uh, where we can gather your input, try to get your questions answered. Um, and, and keep you involved in the issues. And the final culminating session will be a larger event. It'll be open to all members uh, who will be able to uh, learn about and vote on the final priorities of the association. Um, before I turn things back for a goodbye uh, and summation from our chair, uh, uh, ML Mackey today, I just wanna mention to you that we were just wanted, I just wanna thank um, uh, Ring Central, who was helping sponsor these events and has provided the platform for us to do this. Um, and there's going to be a webinar coming up with them in March uh, where uh, uh, they'll be helping small businesses learn how to use the many tools of their system and how to use how to do this, this kind of conferencing much more effectively. So we're looking forward to that. So uh, thank you all. We really appreciate it. And if you haven't signed up for the for, for subsequent events next week and then the culminating event on the 23rd, uh, please do so. Um, ML, thanks for uh, thanks for keeping us on track here. So one of the first things I always have to remind myself when I'm on these meetings is when it's my turn to talk, unmute. That's a pretty <laughs> Pretty basic step. I'm actually really looking forward to what Rig Central has for us all in terms of, I, I think this is a great uh, democratizing capability to, to meet digitally so that we are not burdened by the expense sometimes of traveling and getting together. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I am continuously taking notes. I loved the background on Gary's screen. I really think we need to be thoughtful about how we bring on ourselves as small business owners. So, you know, just in time learning all across the board. Really looking forward to that Ring Central uh, discussion. Today, uh, I'd really, again, like to thank everyone for participating. And as I expected, it was a fascinating, involved, and, and really collaborative discussion. One of the things that I think I spoke to was the, the membership and how we collaborate with each other, but it's also this fascinating dialogue with experts in the field. Like I, I love who you, you bring onto these calls, Todd, you, you and your team set up for this. So so we had the, the pleasure of that experience today. Thank you for that. I'm gonna encourage all of you online to participate in the, the culminating event. I find it fascinating and interesting and uh, looking forward to seeing you all there. Thank you for your time today.